Have you ever been asked by your instructor to do a journal club or to search for a paper about a specific subject, but instead of one, you found 20 papers talking about the same subject, so you get overwhelmed and lost in how to choose one? Well, that's what critical appraisal is for. It is an important part in the evidence-based process. It is to help you to find out articles' strengths and weaknesses. Or, to put it simply, can I trust the results I've seen? Is it applicable or relevant to the research? In evidence-based research, there is a well-known hierarchy of study designs. Each of these studies has different strengths and weaknesses, and they are all at risk of different types of biases, some more than others. For example, case control studies are good for rare diseases and conditions, but they study only one outcome, and it can be hard to find a control group that perfectly matches the case groups. Also, it can be subjected to recall and selection bias, which we'll talk about later. In cohort studies, you may find them suitable for studying multiple exposures and outcomes, and they are also highly generalizable, but they require regular population, and it may be really time-consuming. It is subjected to misclassification and selection bias, which can be reduced in randomized clinical trials or RCTs by blinding. RCTs are considered the gold standard to establish a causal effect, but they have low generalizability, and they can be subjected to detection bias. So, with that being said, it might wonder you what is the best study design to go with. Actually, that depends totally on the type of question that you want to be answered. Different research questions require different study designs. With knowing that, let's solve your problem in finding a good and valid article. There are several simple steps that need to be followed in order to critique an article. Starting with highlighting the research goals in the introduction part, which mainly concern about identifying key concepts, aims, subjects, purpose, and the research theme. Questions should be raised like, why was it done? Is there a clear statement of aims? Will the research question add something new to already existing knowledge? Or will it reconfirm facts that were already known? And what can we get out of it? Second step is to highlight the main information which can be found in the methodology section that mainly provides you with a step-by-step -step description of how the research was done. That will lead us to the third step, which is questioning this method. Where did the method use appropriate to answer the research question? What are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Were the participants selected appropriately? Did they use any method to avoid biases? Fourth step is to examine the included population. Look for statistical differences between the two groups in demographics and whether the two groups match or not. The fifth step is to check in the results section. If the result question was answered or not, and is it statistically and clinically significant? Are the results valid? Did they measure all the results mentioned in the method? Is the type of statistical analysis correct for the type of information analyzed and collected? Now we dig deep into results and limitations, which is the last step in discussion and conclusion part. Now answer these questions. Did they address the biases and how did they avoid them? And what type of limitations this research had? Were they compared or contradicted to prior research? If the results contradicted previous research, why did this happen? Investigate the cause of contradiction. Finally, ask yourself these questions. Are the results generalizable depending on sample size, type of population, and demographics? Is it applicable in your area? Is there further weaknesses you found that is not addressed? Would you accept the result of this study and why? During this video, we mentioned bias types multiple times. But what are they exactly? First, we talked about the detection bias, which is the risk of how the evaluation of the outcome bias affects. Blinding of the outcome assessors reduces the detection bias. Outcome assessors, like study nurses or investigators, are aware of the actual treatment, so they may unconsciously or intentionally alter their assessment. Second, we talked about the selection bias, which is a type of error that occurs when the researcher decides who is going to be studied. It's usually associated with the researchers 
where the selection of participant is not random. Third type we mentioned is the misclassification bias. That occurs when a study participant is categorized into an incorrect category, altering the observed association or the research outcome of interest. Last type is the recall bias, which is a systemic error that occurs when the participant do not remember previous events or experiences accurately. And that's it! The golden tip here is to read the article multiple times and find the answers of these questions. Each time you will find new information and it will feel like you did not read it before. Good luck our researchers! You can find these questions in a checklist in our channel's blog in the description.